Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. What a great event. Thank you for being here. Let's get started. I want to tell a story, a small story. I think I don't think actually is a real story. I don't think many of you have heard about it. Um, anyone can recognize this painting? Anyone? This is uh, one of the great paintings uh, uh, called The Concert. I, I love art. Basically, I go to uh, a lot of museums around the world, uh, uh, like Rembrandt and uh, Vermeer. This is the Vermeer's The Concert painting. This is one of the most expensive paintings of worth $200 million. And Vermeer is a very great artist. Uh, we are still learning about him. He's a 17th century artist. Uh, if you go search for Tim's Vermeer, there's a great documentary about it. Like, he invented a new type of art called like optical, uh, using optical equipment to do an artist. But very, we know very less about him. Like, only 34 paintings have ever been attributed to him, and one of this is actually got stolen, by the way. Um, this painting um, was in uh, Boston's uh, Isabella Stewart uh, uh, Museum. Uh, in uh, roughly about 27 years ago, on March 18th, 1990, in the early morning days, in the morning uh, hours, two people um, uh, came in as disguised as police officers, cops. Uh, they stole the identity. Uh, they breached all the security stuff. Stole 13 paintings from that museum on that day. And uh, that is one of the world's greatest theft ever, a single theft ever, which is roughly attributed to $500 million of uh, theft. Uh, you can go to Wikipedia and uh, learn about it. After that, 1990 uh, theft of museums, the security around the museums have dramatically changed. This is the great museums of artwork, I think. Uh, so what, I want to connect the dots, actually, as we progress, like why this is uh, the case. If you look at this, this is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. This is one of the great uh, museums. I think you should go and visit it. Uh, same thing, Google data centers. We consider all our data centers hosting the great artworks of our customers. Your data, your applications, and everything is, we want to make sure that this is the art of yours. We want to be precious things, we want to treasure it. So all the things that we wanted to secure, whatever the museums are doing around the world, by the way, since 1990, there are no many thefts actually gone down. Same thing in data centers. If you look at the prediction for Gartner, in 2020, the number of theft or security breaches in data centers will go down by 60%. I strongly believe this is true. I'll tell you the reasons for it. Number one is Google, especially Google, is going to hire great talent for security experts around the globe. We keep them happy, we recruit them, and we make sure that we solve the great problems. Number two, the second reason why this is true, this will be true in 2020, is when one customer's security got breached for some reason, any reason, immediately within a few days, we are going to fix the same issue for all the customers, all the hundreds and thousands of customers. This is not possible in the private data centers. It's very difficult because you have to know the community, you have to know what the vulnerabilities are, you have to get the right consulting people to get it patched with and roll it out. It's very, very hard. Whereas if you have thousands of customers, you're always upgrading our security principles, tools, practices. I think the security will be super good in public data centers going forward. There's no question about it. With that, I would like to start the talk with three main things actually we want to cover. Number one, secure VPC. So Google has a virtual private cloud networking, and how, what are the tools we are offering for the security side? Next, Palo Alto Network Jigger is going to give a demo on using our tools to build Palo Alto's great application, third-party applications into Google Cloud. The last, Projecta and Michelle are going to talk about Security Edge. Michelle is from uh, Cloudflare. She's going to talk about how Cloudflare partnered with Google around the globe to protect from 
all kinds of attacks. I'm Subhaya Venkata, Director of Google Networking. I'm going to talk about secure VPC. Let's step back a minute and talk, uh, see where the Google footprints globally is. So you can see from this diagram that we are in four regions so far, US East, US West, Asia, and Europe. And this year, by end of this year, we will be in many more regions, like we have been Singapore, uh, India, Australia, South America, couple more in A Asia, one more in US East Coast. And all the numbers you see in those things are the zones within each region, how many zones we'll have in each region. The footprints is global. All of these are connected with Google's amazing backbone network. And you'll get a great quality of service, bandwidth, latency, everything we do, you get it. So same backbone will be used for Google Search, Google Maps, YouTube, and everything. Next, zooming into only networking specific things, what do we offer in networking toolkit today? Number one, we offer fundamental networking features like VPC networks, regional subnetworks, routing tables, firewall tables, all kinds of cross-project networking we're going to introduce. We did last yesterday a great talk about XPN. We're going to introduce a couple more new features. This will be great. I will be introducing four new features in this talk. The second one is control. Control is about how you actually manage and make sure that you have control over your resources that you have in Google Cloud. That includes IAM permissions, all kinds of monitoring, alerting, dashboards, visualization, as well as Stack Driver, basically the company we bought will provide most of those things. Third is the services. In networking alone, we continuously offer some value-added services to customers. That includes load balancing as a service. Load balancing has many flavors. We have L3 load balancers, we have L7 load balancers, and we introduced internal L3 load balancers, uh, G8, this year. Similarly, we have CDN as a service, we have DNS as a service. These are the new networking services we keep offering. And you'll see many more in the coming uh, months. The last, but not the least, is a hybrid cloud. We believe that big enterprises definitely be in multiple uh, data centers, like private cloud and public cloud. So we offer like VPN as a service, IPsec VPN as a service, cloud router doing BGP as a service, and we do interconnect, private interconnect, public interconnect to Google. All of this will conclude that we have all the necessary and sufficient functionality and features for you to migrate to Google Cloud, either 100% workloads or partial workloads. Now let's zoom into a specific control features, like IAM. In this year alone, we actually enhanced IAM so much that there is a specific talk actually later today and tomorrow about IAM best practices. Let me give a small glimpse about like what IAM has to offer. The new thing we did this year was we thought through how we can organize the resources in such a way that we want to think big for the big enterprises. Let's say that you have a big, huge organizations. And then all this, the Home Depot and all these enterprises coming in, we wanted to create a node called Organization Node. Inside the Organization Node, you can divide, let's say, Engineering Department, Finance Department, and HR Department. All of these are different folders you can create. Folders are a very flexible way to organize. You can organize, for, you can organize your enterprises differently. Let's say you can organize them by partners or the companies you bought. Let's say you, a company buys another company. You can bring this another folder there. And then within the folder, you have projects. Projects is the entity that we had for a long time. All the billing, all the quota enforcement, all kinds of attribution has to happen in the project level. So usually project can be, let's say, divided as test project or development project, or you can say project can be microservices. For example, Spotify gives each microservice a project. Within the project, you can bring up any resources you want, either networking resources, compute resources, or storage resources, as you can see in the diagram. Now, coming to the policies, how, what is IAM features that we offer? 
just me, let me give you a, a simple brief description about I am, how we think about I am. It's just who. Who is I? Who here means actually the identities and roles? And what? What are the tools they have? What are the policies they can apply to where? To where is the resources that we just saw? In other words, Google offers two main things, identities and roles. If you go look inside uh, our Dev console, you will see uh, you can use Google Groups as identities. You can use your email address as identities. And we introduce something called a service account. Service account says, let's say you downloaded a third party application. You don't want to trust that because maybe it's hundreds and thousands of lines of code there. You don't know what that particular application is doing. You can attach an identity to, the, to that particular third party code. That's what a service account is. And IAM policies are the verbs. You can think about actions. For example, you can say, uh, this particular instance admin can have a, a view permission, list permission, add, delete permissions. And then you can actually add some kind of custom verbs to it. We do have custom verbs like set tags, set labels, are all custom verbs. And then we have resources that we just saw, like big resource hierarchies of resources. So all of these are possible. You can mix and match the roles and identities and the policies of the verbs. And then the resources, you can mix and match. It becomes a big matrix of uh, a clear demarcation and authentication you have to play with, like who should get what permissions in each hierarchy. And it's very clear, easy to remember that the hierarchy, if you go back, the hierarchy is, um, in the left hands, you can see that it's inheritance. The topmost, let's say, if you give a instance admin, like org admin, an ownership role, he has complete control of all the resources and all the projects. So there are best practices uh, we should actually give when you're using IAM at Google. Number one is grant roles using Google Groups. Don't use individual email addresses. Create a group and then give that particular identity and then give a particular role for that identity. Similarly, I think you should go something like a used all, all kinds of primitives that we already offer all kinds of verbs and try to give the least common privileges to the resources. So don't give a very broad privileges, then it's very difficult what's going on, as what happened in that um, uh, in the artwork. It's a security breach by identity. They came with like cops identity, and then they stole it, and then they removed the firewalls, that kind of thing they did. So the same thing will happen. IAM is a classic dot I want to connect back to that painting that I just showed you. Because of the security breach, it most likely will happen because of the wrong IAM permissions. And then you can go over that, and then like, to, like tomorrow at like 11:20, you have a great talk about like best practices in IAM, and we are actually offering more features. They'll talk about their feature. One such feature is custom IAM roles. Now IAM is done. Let's move on to let's say the perimeter security and VPC in deep. Um, I don't need to repeat this, but traditionally in the data center. If you go to any third parties, they're going to sell you boxes and proxies. And you have to put these boxes in the middle layers, like load balancers and firewalls. Whenever you need to grow, you have to grow them scale out way. The performance is going to suffer. You need to actually spend a lot of capex to buy more of these firewalls, more of these load balancers, right? It's given. That's how, that's how they actually all the enterprises get money from that. But they become choke points. Let me tell you like a less known secret about this, why this is going to fail in the, in the very short term. The networking bandwidth is increasing very rapidly. We just saw one gig to 10 gig to 40 gig to 100 gig. By 2020, a lot of the public cloud uh, links will be 100 gig. Everything 100 gig. I don't think the catch up of this, the security industry to do a line rate deep packet inspection, line rate IDS and IPS will catch up to 100 gig. That means you need to buy much bigger boxes, maybe more boxes to do 100 gig line rate deep packet inspection. It's not going to work. So you need to think through a completely different model than removing these proxies. So with that, I start off with clearly introducing like four new features. This is a slide you should remember. I think takeaway slide is we proud to offer like distributed firewalls, 
enhancement of distributed firewalls are egress firewalls. It's in alpha right now. We'll go into beta pretty soon. The second feature is VPC network sharing. Yesterday, there was a great talk about this. We are proud to announce a beta of this two days ago. Fourth, the third feature is VPC peering. It's a simple private peering. It's great for SaaS providers, so consumers can access all the producers' SaaS services. The fourth feature is super important for all the third-party appliances to come to Google and provide their virtual appliances within Google is multi-nic support for virtual machines. It is alpha right now. We're going to go to beta pretty soon. And there's one more stuff in security, which I don't want to talk about it here. We'll skip the presentation in this is we have more application-level security coming up called identity-aware proxy. We have custom IAM roles. And we have data loss prevention. There's a nice demo in the, in the keynote. And then we have working more towards content-aware uh, security, too. So you're going to see that. Let's focus on VPC alone in this particular presentation. Let's start with uh, VPC uh, topology one. I have like five topologies, the solutions you can th think about, how you can use these solutions. Let's say I have an organization. Think example.com or Spotify.com. Then you have, a, you wanted the networks to be isolated for a specific reason. Maybe you bought a company or there is a completely department. Let's say that engineering department should not want to see the uh, quarterly results of the sales department. So you want to keep the sales department completely isolated in a different network. Even by mistake of either firewall rules or IAM policies, no engineer should be able to watch our sales department's quarterly reports. It's pure isolation. This is one model. So you, you have two different networks under the same organization, two different security admins. We do support it. And both networks are global, by the way. So Google's VPCs are global. And, but they're isolated. You can bring up up to five networks in a project, and within an organization, you can bring up hundreds of networks. There is absolutely, we don't limit it in, in an organization. If you have a project, we'll limit to five, but if you call the support, we can even increase that limit too. Now, if you have that, now you can say, hey, still, I want at some specific, let's say my Inge VP should be able to access uh, uh, the sales one, or my engineering uh, dev development team should be able to access the test department or something like that. Then you can punch the hole using a specific public IPs. You can create them called forwarding IPs, and you can actually create firewall rules. Only those particular IPs are going to talk to each other, and you can create firewall rules in both networks. That means two different, different networks are going to talk on public IPs. And there is a second way to do this is maybe because you may think that oh, public IP still there's a perception that it's going to the internet. Actually, it's not going to the internet. It is going through the still the Google's backbone network because those IPs are still Google public IPs. Just to make the things comfortable, you can create like VPN tunnels between the two networks. It costs a little bit more because you have to bring up this virtual IPsec VPN gateways that Google offers and cloud router that Google offers, but it just gives you the security that everything crossing the two networks across the regions is more secure in IPsec channels. Optimal topology number three. This we want to be very, very proud of. We thought through from scratch. This is called uh, VPC sharing. Uh, where you have, as Spotify mentioned yesterday, a lot of people are trying to use project. I just want the project to be by department where they have a complete freedom to create their compute and storage resources. Networking is completely different. I wanted to have a different department to handle the networking stuff. Let's create a global network for all the departments to attach to. And my security team and networking team is make sure that no one stepped onto each other. That's the request we got from all the customers. Hey, give us like one network where all my departments can use that network. And we know how to create firewall rules in that one network. So we offer a shared VPC. Now, optimal topology number four, in the same organization, multi nic support. This is fantastic. This creates a whole ecosystem of third parties. We are working with so many partners. You will see a talk and demo from Palo Alto Networks. If you have an organization, again, same organization, you have two networks, you want to make sure that 
all the VMs in one network has to funnel through a set of VMs where you want to do all kinds of security policies, deep packet inspections, IDS, IPS to be done in those VMs, then use multi-nic feature. You can say that all the consumer network has to have a route to these multi-nic VMs in the producer network, then you can do actually all the processing there. It's a kind of proxying, but you have this option available. You, if you have a services with all the third-party appliances, you can tell them that please bring it to Google Cloud. They're happy to do it. Optimal topology number five, VPC network peering. We are very proud to offer this as an alpha thing. This is a game changer too. This is going to provide a value-based versus the cost-based for all the SaaS providers. What that means is I am a producer of some service X, a SaaS service. If a customer, consumer comes and asks me, hey, I wanted your service, let's say a spanner service or anything you wanted, I can bring up 10, two VMs, I can charge 10 VMs worth. They don't need to know how many VMs I'm running for them. It's completely hidden because two different organizations, two different networks are peering. All you need to do is having a peering agreement. And we beautifully did this in the UI itself. Two different organizations two different networks can peer with each other. First consumer or producer has to say, hey, I want to peer with this organization, this project, this network. And then the call comes to that. Other organization admin has to accept in the UI saying that, okay, I accept that I peer with this other organization network. Boom. Nothing, no proxies, nothing. Behind the scenes, everything is a magic. We mesh all the VMs, full mesh between the producer and consumer. There is no proxy. The performance is exactly the same. And whenever you want, you can delete the peering. It's a bi-directional peering. Even a single, let's say, producer decided that, like, I don't want peering with you anymore. You can cut the peering. All the routing will go away. It's a magic of routing, distributed routing between the two networks. And once the peering is established, you can use actual load balancers. A consumer can actually talk to the internal load balancing whip inside the producer network and get the services done. And this is in alpha. If you're interested, please talk to us. We can whitelist you. The fourth feature in today, it's a lot of features. Fourth new feature, we're very happy to offer, egress firewalls. So far, for a couple of years, we have, we offered distributed firewalls, thank you very much, distributed firewalls, VM to VM, and internet to VM, ingress side. Exact same thing, we offer VM to internet. Same connection tracking firewall, stateful, everything is stateful firewalls. We do connection tracking. We do priority, deny and permit in all directions. No choke points, everything is distributed routing, distributed firewalls. Just to complete the picture, GKE firewalls. Another big request for the GCE firewalls is, hey, I have only limited quota, 200 firewall rules I can, I can configure. Hey, Subai, can you increase the quota for like more firewall rules? I have micro-segmentation going on. We are working on it. But if you're running in containers, you have other option. There's a rich ecosystem of actual open source community there in GKE. You can go and create a GKE policy. It'll create a lot of firewall rules in IP tables in your hosts. You can use that. And you can use actually pretty well all the micro-segmentation, whatever you have in GKE, you can use that to create behind the scenes IP tables. And we are working on all of these things. Another feature called private access to Google services. As you see machine learning services, analytic services, storage services, so many services we offer in a, in a different namespace in like highly available thing than from the uh, VMs. But if you are, we have a VPC with a private IP address, RFC 19 IP address space, you can access privately those services without having any public IP address. You can just go to the subnetworks UI, click, and say enable, private access to Google services, boom, that's it, done. Just one click away. Yesterday there was a demo of this in one of the talks. But that means from any client from the internet cannot access the private VMs, but if they want to access the Google services, they have to go through these Google APIs. They need to have permission to go through the Google APIs. 
more than security stuff. It's all documented in our GCP uh, nicely uh, in our web pages. If you have VMs with private IP addresses and without private, with external addresses and without external addresses, we have a couple of security things. We do offer bash and host support. All gcloud commands we have SOX proxying for SSH for tunneling. We have port forwarding with SSH tunneling. We have HTTPS with SSL keys. And without IP external IP addresses, we have NAT. You can actually easily set up your own NAT gateways. All of these things, four new features we are offering in networking is available because of our cloud networking uh, distributed stack. Basically, it's a software-defined stack. We call it Andromeda stack. And there is a talk happened yesterday. You can watch it in YouTube. We talk more about this. To recap, just remember, so we have these features available for you, egress firewalls, VPC sharing, VPC peering, multi nic support. With that, thank you very much. Give it to Jigar from Palo Alto Networks, showing you the demo. OK, thank you, Subaya. So uh, my name is Jigar Sharma, product manager at Palo Alto Networks. I focus on public clouds. So before I begin, I would like to call out that we're going to show you a demo uh, that shows how we're going to provide security in the uh, Google Cloud environment. Right? So there's a few set of new features coming. I'm not going to talk about all of them, just the specific things that I'm going to show in this demo. Okay. So before I go ahead, a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you are network admins or networking experts? OK, fair number. How about security guys? OK, I see some of them, the same hands, which just makes sense. And how about application or other infrastructure folks? OK, so good mix. So this is sort of the DevOps kind of world. OK. So Public cloud operates in a shared security model, right? Urs mentioned a whole bunch of security features in the morning. So Baya mentioned a lot others, right? So Google takes care of security off the cloud. But once a packet hits your VPC or a network, it's your responsibility to protect that environment. And there's a lot of great tools they give you, right? IAM rules, Google Cloud Firewall, ACL, all those components. But even beyond that, once the packet comes in, if there's malware, there's no malware, how do you look for that? How do you protect against that, right? So if you look at a Google Cloud firewall, right, GCP firewall rules, they pretty much look like this, right? You can do controls at a five tuple level, source, destination, port protocol, right? That's what you do. So a typical transaction would probably look like this. This is the information you see in the wire, and it's a 344 kilobyte transaction. What if you could actually look at more things and make decisions based on that? So for example, oh, it's not just 443, it's actually HTTP running on SSL. And oh, it's, this is the specific user, and they belong to the specific LDAP or AD user group. And the destination traffic is actually geo-mapped to you know, some user in Canada or some destination in Canada. What are the attributes of that URL? You know, is that a known command control server? Or is it just regular, commercial, proper, benign server? Right? So there's all these other additional intelligence and metadata that can be valuable in making a decision. And in addition, just because it's HTTP doesn't mean anything anymore. Right? Everything is pretty much HTTP, especially in the public cloud. So for example, if it's a you know, slide sharing application, oh, and it's got a payload of a PDF file being transferred. Right? So those are important attributes you want to look at. Now this is a benign example of a flow, let's say, going out from a Google Cloud VM outbound. Everything should allow it, right? It looks all perfect and benign. But your firewall rules, if this was actually some real malware, like a pre-executable that's going through and it's got malware, you wouldn't know how to control for it in effect. So if you look at an attack lifecycle, you know, and this is one manifestation, this is a famous framework in effect, that typical exploit vectors happen from you know, either an insider making some mistakes or a malicious insider, or an outsider doing a breach. So essentially, I like to call it a north-south problem. Somebody's breached in, and then they want to branch off and find out where next to go, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And a lot of use cases are hybrid, right? You may have a big application in the public cloud, but there might be some connection going back to on-prem. That becomes a really important vector for the attack. And the most common things we see in terms of attacks is you know, people want to steal your data. That's the most valuable asset you've got, right? It's whether it's user information, credit card information, so on. 
now we're also starting to see botnets also sprouting up, right? If you look at the data out there, a number of public cloud VMs, when they get hijacked, because mostly of you know, poor security practices, they become really good botnets because the bandwidth available from a public cloud environment is enormously well uh, capable. You know, it's very powerful networking. So botnets have a very easy way of spreading around. And then you know, less often, we also start to see that you've got really good compute resources. Let's run a, you know, a Bitcoin mining operation. You know, it's really cheap compute. As long as you get it, it's free money. Right? So to prevent this, these type of attacks, what you need is complete visibility in the enterprise network and in the cloud, in the mobile, you need visibility. What you can't see, you can't really protect. The next element is reducing the attack surface. So you're obviously trying to narrow that if it's a web application, you may set up GCP firewall rules to say open 40 and 443. You do all the basic things to say reduce attack surface. If you know the applications, you can identify applications, put controls based on applications specifically. And then comes the more intelligent part to say, is there actually malware? Are these all known CVE and vulnerabilities that are out there known? Let's block them right out of the box, right? So the attacker should not have an opportunity to say, I'm going to go hack this. Obviously, this requires that all your systems are patched correctly as often as possible, so you're protected against known vulnerabilities. But what about unknown vulnerabilities, right? So these can be zero-day attacks or brand new attacks that are not zero-day ca caliber, but people don't know about them. How quickly can we fix them, right? Because the goal is to do prevention and not really say, OK, we found a problem. Let's go fix it, throw in the incident response team, spend lots of hours and dollars on consulting people coming doing IR and forensics. You want to put up as much protection as possible so you're not spending you know, money later on. So to do this requires a lot of capabilities under the hood. So I'm not going to go through these things because there's a lot of detail in there. Uh, but I'll pick a quick specific example. Let's say there's a malware that is spreading, right? It's a known malware. What application is it attacking? Typically, malware is looking for exploits in specific applications or specific binaries, right? Often that application is going to be encrypted, right? Pretty much 70% or more of applications are getting encrypted. So you want a solution that's going to be able to even do SSL decrypt when it's necessary. And then you want to have coverage, like I was saying, across the board. So obviously, cloud visibility is really important. And then for those unknown things, like I said, there's a lot of machine learning, dynamic analysis, static analysis techniques. So I'm not going into details, but those are typical capabilities you'd need to sort of provide that protection. So let me switch gears and say, how does this manifest in the Google Cloud environment, right? So the idea is that to bring a next generation firewall, which has all these capabilities, we needed a multi-net capability. So Google has that capability so that you can clean, create clean segmentation. So you have your management network. You may have a public-facing side network for internet-based fo fo focused services. And then you may have multiple private networks where you're running your applications in different tiers. So the firewall can now connect across all of them and provide that north-south and east-west security between application tiers. Obviously, this is a single firewall. I wouldn't recommend anybody to put this up right now, right? Because it's a single point of failure. What you need is obviously a scale-out architecture that you have load balancers that are front-ending your service, you put security behind it, and then you put the application tier behind it. Now, obviously, this is a static picture, so to speak, right? And the cloud is all about elasticity. So as demand for your services grow, your web tier or your front-end tier is growing, other things behind it are automatically scaling, the firewall and the security services also need to scale behind it. And this has to be sort of very seamless to you, which means you need bootstrapping and automation. But it has to be transparent. You can't be spending time to say, oh, stuff scaled up. I need to do something, right? OK. So I showed an internet-facing scale-out architecture. Uh, there's obviously other use cases, primarily hybrid cloud, meaning on-prem connecting into the Google Cloud environment. There's very specific security scenarios that need to be covered there. The segmentation, like I said, between application tiers. And then between different projects, like so by showing, when you have project one, let's say department one talking to department two, where department one or application one has higher trust level, the other one has a lower trust level. If you're going to do full VPC peering, do you really want that full mesh? If it's between two networks of equal trust, it makes sense. If there are networks of different trust, you probably want to do deeper inspection to say, if I have this partner connecting in, I want to let them 
access to only these things. I want to make sure that if they are hacked, I don't get hacked, right? And then the internet-facing scale-out perimeter capability I showed uh, with the scale-out story. So I'll give you a demo so that it becomes a little bit more apparent of what we're bringing to the table. So I'm going to switch over to the demo. So here you see a typical Google Cloud uh, network set up in a project. I've got four networks set up. So I've got the database network. We've got a management network for the management traffic, an internet-facing public traffic network, and a web network, right? And on the compute side, I've got three VMs only. Very simple demo in that sense. So this is the firewall, the next generation firewall. It's a four NIC setup, like I showed in the diagram. And there's a database network and a web server network where the database and the web server are living. The web server is running a simple Apache server and a WordPress server. And the WordPress server has content that's living in the database. So uh, the demo's intention is to show, to show you that north-south and that east-west protection. Right? So, so this is my web server. This is the Apache. It's really simple. You know, I load it up. And you know, it's got this typical content. And you know, as usual, obligatory, you've got to put a cat video. So, you know, this HTTP content coming in, right? So if I go and look into the firewall, I mean, it's kind of fun. You put up, let's say, a good monitoring solution like us as just an application visibility service, and you should see the number of people doing port scans. And then once you say open port, they start trying to poke through the holes, right? So this is the interface for the firewall. And, right, so let me first walk you through the policies I've configured in this demo. So the first thing you see is the left side is the source side, and the right side is the destination. So I see inbound web going from the public internet side to the web tier. And I said, allow web browsing. Right? So I'm not saying allow anything else, just web browsing. We're going to look at the packets to say, are these actual HTTP packets, HTTP transaction? Right? Nothing else should be allowed. And then web to DB, web's, web area going to database. So what I'm saying is allow SQL traffic only, actually specifically MySQL, because by studying and identifying the patterns, we know what MySQL looks like. So we're saying, OK, allow MySQL only. The third thing I'm doing is all the Linux VMs, the web server, the database, they probably need to do updates. So I'm going from web to, and database to the public internet. I'm saying only allow updates right, for APD get or YUM updates. I could even further lock it down and say, you can only go to Canonical to get your updates, or whatever your repo is. So you can do very specific lockdowns. And then I've got the special exception to say, allow SSH only for my corporate IP address. And my corporate IP addresses are loaded here. Right? So that way, I can do specific management, even over the open internet, but still lock down to my IPs. Right? So if I go to the monitor tab, this is showing the traffic logs of our firewall. So if I do a refresh, you can see that there's a lot of traffic coming in. OK, shouldn't have hit refresh there. OK, so all right. you can see there's a lot of traffic coming in from the open internet. And you can see a lot of people are trying to connect to my public IP. By the way, this public IP has no real application. But somebody's sitting there and just constantly scanning and looking for the stuff. Uh, you can see, obviously, there's traffic coming from Moscone, which is the, the, re the page I just loaded. So that was the Apache server. And we obviously identified. and. Sometimes we will not get enough packets to say what kind of traffic it is. So we're saying incomplete. But let's say I go back and reload the page. And then just got to refresh the, oops. All right, can't browse, scroll across. Let me maximize this so it's easier. All right, so if I refresh the data, you're going to see there's traffic uh, for web browsing coming in. So now similarly. If uh, I have a WordPress on that same server, so I reload the WordPress pages. So this obviously is going to go transaction with the WordPress server. That's going to reach into the SQL database. So if I go back and look at the, da at the logs, what I'm seeing is traffic coming in from the public internet to the web zone, going to the it's web browsing traffic. And then what you would expect to see is further down is the web server is reaching into the database, and SQL transactions are happening there. So I'm doing a very specific lockdown to say 
These are the only flows you should allow based on the application patterns. Now, in addition, you can obviously enable deeper IDS, IDS things so that if your web server is compromised and somebody is trying to do a SQL injection or another attack on the database, you would be able to prevent that. Now, the more interesting thing is obviously is also the exfiltration part. So you can make sure that somebody cannot do mass FTP transfers or mass HTTP transfers or big file outflows, right? So those are the things that we intend to sort of provide in terms of protection. So there's a demo at our booth in the expo floor if you want to take a look. And there's more information on the website. All right. So that's all I had for the demo. If you've got questions, I can take them afterwards. Right? So after that, I'll, after that, I'll hand over to Prajakta. Okay. Which one should I use? Which laptop? So hi, folks. I'm Prajikta. I'm a product manager in cloud networking. So how many of you stay up at night thinking about DDoS attacks? Nobody? Your networks are super secure. Yeah. So, and I'm sure they're on Google Cloud, which is why you don't stay up at night. So that's great. Uh, so most of you know about uh, DDoS attacks. I'm not going to go into them. Uh, most of you know that they're also classified into three categories, network, connection, application. Each of these attacks has interesting characteristics. So the layer three will try to just overwhelm your network and consume all the bandwidth. With layer four, basically, they're trying to exhaust any type of component in your network that has a state table. And the layer seven ones try to exploit the characteristics of your application. Now, here is the interesting bit. Most of you may not know, but when you're actually on Google Cloud Platform, and you're using Google Cloud Load Balancing or CDN, your deployments have inbuilt or rather implicit DDoS protection for layer three and layer four. And you can, of course, complement this with offerings from our other partners and our third party providers. So let's take a closer look. You have your VM. Uh, what, what may not be obvious is that you actually have throttles per VM at 10 Gbps, which means even if you get attacked, there is going to be no impact to your standing as a customer. Next, if you actually deploy Google Cloud Load Balancing, and you know that it comes in various flavors, such as HTTP, HTTPS Load Balancing, SSL Proxy, uh, TCP Proxy. So if you implement that, you do actually get protection against layer 3 and layer 4 attacks, so attacks such as SYN floods, IP fragment floods, and so on. And in fact, HTTP, HTTPS load balancing not only protects you against these attacks, but other attacks such as slow loris and so on. And then, of course, you can use Cloud CDN along with that, so you can serve your legitimate users from the edge of our network. This one just recaps what I spoke about, so I'm actually going to skip, skip this slide. So I wanted to tell you an interesting story. How many of you have heard of Brian Krebs? Great. So for those of you who did not raise your hand, uh, he's an investigative journalist. He actually exposes criminals. Uh, he has a website called krebsonsecurity.com. As you can imagine, uh, when he did that, the criminals came after him Then they started DDoSing his website. And the attacks got so huge that he was asked by his previous provider to move because it would have impacted their other customers. He came to Google for help. And so we, we hosted him for free on Google Cloud infrastructure under a project we call Project Shield. So it is to protect uh, the freedom of speech and also to protect journalists and then other entities that participate in elections and so on. Now, here is an interesting set of e events that were told to me by our DDoS expert. This is how it actually rolled out after Krebs on security came to the Google Cloud platform. So, when he came back up, it was hit with 130 million packets per second of SYN floods. And for those of you who are familiar with Mirai botnets, this was precisely that. It also received additional 60 million packets per second of resets. The attack was huge, but there was no impact. And this is because the SYN floods were handled by Google infrastructure. Now, a minute later, the attack shifted. It was 250k queries per second attack from about 145k Mirai IPs. And this is a good example of how attackers try random stuff 
until, until they find something that works. An hour later, there were a few more attacks, but there was no impact to his site. The Google infrastructure continued to shield it. At this point, there was a bit of a respite, so the attacks stopped for some time. Next morning, Brian was happy. He posted this post called The Democratization of Censorship and how Google infrastructure was hosting and protecting his website. Four hours after this blog post, he was hit with 450k queries per second of HTTP floods from 175k Mirai IPs. And this went on and on and on. There were dozens of attacks. But it also gave our team a really great opportunity to validate Google's defenses. So why am I telling you this story? First, the happy ending. Krebs on security.com continues to run unimpacted on Google Cloud. But I told you about this incident because the same infrastructure protects your deployments in the Google Cloud. This, is, this happens when you enable either Google Cloud load balancing or Google Cloud load balancing with Cloud CDN. And you can definitely complement this with services and appliance from our third party providers. And so to talk more about that, I'd like to invite Michelle, the co-founder of Cloudflare. I'm one of the founders of Cloudflare, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about security and some of the toughest challenges that we're, that we're dealing with. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to tell you a little bit about Cloudflare, because many of you maybe not know about us. Uh, at some level, we're a little bit of a boring infrastructure company that when we do our jobs right, we're behind the scenes. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit more. So our mission as a company is to help build a better internet. We run one of the largest networks in the world. So we have over 100 points of presence um, around the world. That means in some not so lo exotic locations like San Jose, California, or Los Angeles, uh, to over 20 across mainland China, uh, as well as points of presence across Africa and Latin America. We're really close to where people are consuming the internet. We're really close to the eyeballs. Our network does about 10 million requests per second. Uh, and what that means is about 10% of all internet requests touches Cloudflare's network. So if you've been online this morning surfing the internet, it's likely that you've been interacting with Cloudflare's network behind the scenes. We have a lot of different customers. Over 6 million uh, customers use Cloudflare, from large businesses to small businesses to bloggers around the world. And they come to us because we're really helping solve a lot of the internet's toughest challenges, including performance, security, reliability, and insights. All of these things that used to be very hard and used to buy a lot of hardware boxes for are moving out to the edge as a service, and we do all of that on behalf of our customers. Today, I want to dig into a little bit more on the security side. Because we see 10 million requests per second, we get a lot of insights into what's going on on the security landscape and wanted to share some of those with you today. And so uh, Projecto was talking about DDoS attacks. So, this is the size of DDoS attacks and how they're on the rise. In the last few years, there has been a huge acceleration to which the size of the attacks are. As, as a business, as a network operator, it's really scary to have to think, oh my god, the D DDoS attacks are now up to 300 gigabits per second. Before, 50 gigs per second used to be considered big. And now, every day at Cloudflare, our customers are seeing routinely 300 and 400 gigabit per second attacks. And then back in November, OVH, a large uh, network provider in Europe, talked about seeing a, an attack as large as a terabit per second. This is not going away. So DDoS attacks are definitely getting bigger. Part of this is because of the Internet of Things that are coming online. Cameras, refrigerators, cars, everything is getting connected to the internet. This is not going away. And so what the experts say is, oh my god, as Internet of Things come online, there are going to be more security vulnerabilities and threats. And that is true. And so as a business, you need to figure out, how am I going to deal with these sorts of things? Because this is absolutely true. And the Merzai botnet was a bunch of cameras that were enabled that, that caused that attack um, against many customers, including Brian Krebs. The third is, you know, the size is one thing, new devices is a new thing, but the third is that the, the attacks are getting more complex against the application layer. They're really, really targeted and, and, and uh, clever. And what that means is you need more control as a business owner to be able to stop that 
or shared intelligence so that, you're, that whatever solution you're using learns faster so that if someone else sees that same sort of um, complicated attack at the application layer, you're protected against that. So those are just some trends that we're seeing. So what does this all boil up to? And so we talked a lot about um, what Google Cloud does for you. So why would you also need Cloudflare? And so we have over tens of, we have over 25,000 joint customers with Google Cloud that are also using Cloudflare. And so what are they getting in addition? So think about us as a security platform. OK, um, we crowdsource all the threat data from those 10 million requests per second so that you are protected from any sort of attack that our other 6 million customers are seeing. So we crowdsource it. It's an automatic learning. And this is the first time where all the good guys have banded together to help protect ourselves against the botnets and the bad guys, and it's working. We have presences in China, so if you have internet users coming to your site in China, you can now be really close to their eyeball. Again, we have over 20 um, points of presence in mainland China. Before, if you were thinking about DDoS or firewalls or encryption or DNS or load balancing or rate limiting, you might buy that from five or six different security vendors. Today, again, the platform security is you're getting that all from Cloudflare as a service. Um, there's a lot of new modern internet standards that are pushing forward to help keep us into the future, whether it's TLS 1.3, which is a new cryptography standard, whether it's HTTP2, which is much more of a performance side, or DNSSEC. Cloudflare makes that super easy for all of our 6 million customers to adapt in real time. So we push that live, and you automatically get access to it without having to update your origin server. We also provide flat rate pricing. So if, if you get a DDoS attack, there's no spike in pricing. It's predictable. It's the exact same thing month to month because we know how bad, if you are under DDoS attack, how that already is a bad day. We don't want to make it a worse day. Google Cloud is an amazing service, and many of you are already customers or thinking about joining them. Um, but you also may have on premise. You also be may, may be using a second cloud provider, or who knows, you might also be using GoDaddy. Cloudflare sits at the network layer. So we work with regardless what you're using for store compute, and you can make sure that anything that you're running in those environments have the performance, security, reliability, and insights that we offer. And so a true partnership means when you partner together, you create value. And Google and Cloudflare has done that. Um, we both run large networks. And what we've done is we've interconnected in 41 of those locations, which means that we pass the savings on to the end customer. So at the end of the day, if you are a Google Cloud Compute customer and a Cloudflare customer, you are saving money. And I just want to walk through two um, um, examples, uh, case studies of how other customers so Discord is a voice um, and text messaging service for online computer games. Uh, this company has gr had explosive growth last year. They went from about 25,000 concurrent users to 2.4 million in a year. That's 9,000% growth. Just think about that. Think about that if you had to manage that in your sh shoes. It was their, their team was working really, really hard. So a couple of things that were happening. First, they used to buy a lot of hardware, a lot of on-premise hardware. That's how they used to manage their environment. But what happened is it turns out that a lot of folks, players who are playing video games, like to launch attacks against each other. And they had to deal with a lot of different types of layer 3, layer 4, layer 7 DDoS attacks. And so they signed up for Cloudflare, and we helped get rid of those automatically. They moved their infrastructure into uh, Google Cloud, and it helped them scale much more quickly than what they were doing before. The end result is when they looked at what they were spending in 2015 versus what they spent in 2016, together, Cloudflare and Google saved them over $100,000 a month. That's over a million dollars a year, plus they got this great performance and security solution because they're really close to all their visitors around the world. So that's example one. Example two is a company called Quizlet. Uh, they're one of the top 100 Alexa-ranked websites. Uh, it helps students around the world do homework. Turns out there's a lot of students around the world that aren't necessarily North America. They're everywhere. So they have a lot of traffic that's very, very, very Google, uh, very, very global. And so they came to Cloudflare because they needed, they were having huge performance issues and, and security issues. And so because we had over 100 points of presence, they immediately saw a huge performance um, increase, Im improvement uh, by coming onto Cloudflare and with Google Cloud. And what they saw, because of our partnership, that they see a 76% savings in their bandwidth bill. 76, they saw their bandwidth drop by 76%. And this is by caching closer to the internet surfers and by offloading all, the, all of the traffic really, really out at the edge. 
That translated into a savings of about 15% off of their bandwidth bill from month to month on Google Cloud. And so this is an example of a partnership that, um, again, I think any good partnership means delivering value to the end customer. And we're really honored to be working with the Google Cloud team. They're terrific and helping attack some of the, solve some of the, the biggest challenges on the internet. So thank you so much. Um, and we really value our partners and our providers as well. So I'm going to give you guys a test, guys and girls, a test. Um, what did we talk about first? So let's bring it all together into a cloud networking security blueprint. The first thing that you need to really worry about is ensuring that your VPC is safe and secure. Uh, Subaya so talked about the variety of tools that you have at your disposal. So you've got VPC topologies for isolation. You've got distributed firewalls. You've got IAM. And you can access any of Google's own services, such as machine learning or BigQuery, internally without going to the internet. This is something we didn't talk about because there are a number of interesting sessions. But that is secure connectivity. We do realize you have deployments either on-prem or in other clouds. And so we want to ensure that you can connect those to GCP very securely. You've got direct peering, carrier interconnect, VPNs, and a new one that we introduced in this GCP Next called private interconnect. Jigar spoke about using third-party virtual appliances. One of the points I did want to mention is make sure that you scale out your virtual appliances using Google internal load balancing, because you don't want to create new choke points in your network. Definitely look at our Google Global Load Balancer. So this comes, as I mentioned before, in HTTPS load balancing, SSL proxy, TCP proxy. You get built-in layer 3 and layer 4 DDoS protection with this. And you can also supplement that with Cloud CDN. And finally, Google's network. This is a high-capacity, high-performance network that not only gives you global connectivity and global reach, but also protects you against attacks, including UDP-based attacks. And then you can finally complement all of this with DDoS defense from our third party provider. So you just heard from Michelle about DDoS defense from Cloudflare. And we have a bunch of other partners or providers that you can work with as well. Yeah, so let, actually, yes, I just want you to actually take a minute and look at this. Because this is actually the networking blueprint that a lot of our customers use today. And this is how they secure their workloads on Google Cloud. This is an interesting quote from Evernote. Uh, how many of you know that Evernote recently migrated to Google Cloud Platform? Correct. So they started migrating roughly around September of 2016. And the interesting comment that they made is, we moved to the Google Cloud because we can not only provide security as good as what we have on-prem, but we can actually improve on it. We can provide all of these protections, and we have this expertise uh, in Google that we would not have had on-prem. And that is a huge endorsement. And the way they did it is they followed this cloud networking blueprint. So our goal today was to share it with you. We hope you make use of it. And we hope it lets you sleep peacefully at night. So thank you, everyone, and stay safe. Thanks. <laughs>